So, at the most, 36% of the protein you eat can be converted to glucose. But, protein has bulk. Just like lettuce or cucumbers have bulk. And it will also raise blood sugar in a diabetic simply by distending the gut. Okay? Now, uh, now, the existence of amylin uh, I knew about 15 years ago when I, or 20 years ago when I wrote my second book. I, all I could do is use its existence as a lesson that you can't eat anything you want. Anything will raise blood sugar in a diabetic. But now, amylin and amylin amyl analogs and GLP anal one la a analogs are available on the market. They're being sold to lower blood sugar, and it's been sh the manufacturers have demonstrated a small effect on hemoglobin A1C, maybe half of a percent uh, or thereabouts. But these are the satiety hormones of the body. So here we have potential miracle drugs for curbing overeating. Anyone here, I don't see many fat people here, which is very rare, uh, but anyone here who thinks that, that they have cravings or are overeaters would benefit from one of these incretin mimetics, as they call them. Um, and they're available in a number of forms. The effective ones are the injectable ones. They come in pens with such tiny needles that you can hardly see it. It's maybe three times the thickness of a hair. And uh, you just throw it in and push a button and you get a shot of this miracle drug. Now the most miraculous of the three injectables that are on the market today is called Victoza. It's a long-acting GLP-1 analog. Now, the manufacturer and the ADA say you can't use this on type 1 diabetics because they don't make any amylin and GL the function of GLP-1 is to tell the pancreas to make amylin. But I'm using it on any number of type 1s and it's curbing their appetite. So, apparently GLP-1 not only stimulates the production of amylin, but also has an independent satiety effect of its own. So I'm using it contrary to the directions or the instructions of the powers that be and am achieving miraculous results. It has totally changed the nature of my practice. And you're saying lower insulin doses now from it? Um, yeah, well, because uh, these things can also lower blood sugar, we have to be very careful of possible hypoglycemia after meals. So we have to frequently lower the amount of insulin that people take for meals if they're taking Victoza. Okay? It doesn't do that for everyone, but it does that for many. And uh, I cannot overemphasize the tremendous value of this stuff, not, not only for diabetics, but obviously for anyone who's an overeater, which is, the, I guess, 60% of our population. We have people with carbohydrate cravings, and carbohydrate craving has to do with a, an, uh, a, a, a transporter called LNAA, uh, low molecular weight neutral amino acid transporter, that uh, takes proteins and deposits them in the brain. Now, insulin causes proteins to be deposited in muscle. If you're eating a lot of carbohydrate, you're going to uh, deposit much of your proteins into your muscles. And you're also going to make glycogen and you're going to make fat and so on. But tryptophan does not readily get 
deposited in muscles by insulin. Tryptophan is the precursor of serotonin. Serotonin is that stuff in the brain that calms you down, that makes you satisfied, that um, Prozac uh, uh, indirectly generates. If you are taking a lot, are uh, making a lot of insulin, you're going to call, give tryptophan a free ride on LNAA because the other proteins are being deposited in muscle. And therefore, the carbohydrate that causes you to make more insulin, if you're not diabetic, is going to make you happier. It's going to increase your serotonin levels. Okay? So, um, it's sort of uh, a natural thing that if you get exposed to carbohydrate, you can become addicted to it because you feel better. And uh, it's even been shown that Mises, everyone know what Mises are? <laughs> uh, Mises will develop carbohydrate addiction if exposed to it on a continuous basis, probably for the same reason. So, uh, one lesson of the many here is that we have these mag this magical new drug that's quite benign. By the way, it's major si uh, the, the Victoza. Uh, its major side effect is um, slowing of gastric emptying and therefore potential nausea. And what I do is I start people at a low dose and we slowly increase it. It might take two or three weeks to get it up to a, a dose that actually can controls the overeating. And each person needs a different dose. It's not a uniform thing. Uh, okay. Now we'll get on to uh, another subject. About somewhere in the past 10 or 15 years, I had four patients at the same time who were underweight and wanted to gain weight. Uh, a typical person was a 40, uh, I'm sorry, a, a guy in his 60s who was brought in by his wife. He's a very tall fellow. He comes in looking like death, very, very skinny, gaunt, depressed. Uh, and the wife says, gee, uh, doc, you've got to get put some weight on him. Well, his blood sugar at the first visit was 400. And uh, the rec, I require all my new patients to fill out my data sheets with their blood sugars for the past two weeks, and he was hovering around 400 most of the time. So I said, we're going to have to put him on insulin. No one, he had been a type 2 who managed to burn out his beta cells by years of high carbohydrate and high blood sugars. So now he was a type 1. And uh, we, I said to his wife, we'll put him on insulin and he'll certainly gain weight because he won't be peeing away his calories. He was peeing all day long. Anything he ate turned to glucose, came out in his urine. He was peeing away his calories and his vitamins. So uh, I put him on insulin. We very easily got his blood sugars controlled. And wife brings him in after he's well controlled. He's still, still too skinny. You've got to put more weight on him. I'd already put 25 pounds on him. Uh, I guess it was mostly muscle. Uh, so I said, okay, I got three other guys. I have to figure out what to do. Three other people who wanted to gain weight. Okay.